All right, so I just wanted to give a little bit more week two reaction, touch on some big things, put Alabama, Colorado, and Wisconsin into the spotlight, look at their schedules, and give my full breakdown. Is Alabama done right now? We are getting more week two updates trickling in. You can see another ranking system coming out. Georgia at number one, Bama down to two, Florida State up to three. You can see Texas up six spots. You can see Oregon State trending up, Miami trending up as well. Syracuse, they've been very dominant in their two wins, but I would caution people, they're not facing world beaters or anything like that. You've got, Lu man, was Murray State really that good? I might have to look at that Louisville-Murray State game again because Louisville is just up historically on all of these analytical models. Wisconsin down nine spots. We're going to talk about them. Cincinnati up to number 30. They've had two very impressive performances, uh, but I thought this was funny. Take a look at Col number one. The game yesterday with Colorado was just totally weird. Like how quickly Colorado has turned around their football program going from 1 and 11 to Deion Sanders to the transfer portal. It's truly like five years ago, even four years ago, this turnaround would have been completely impossible. If Deion Sanders took over a 1 and 11 Colorado team without the transfer portal, with the whole thing where you have to wait a year when transferring, this team would probably win two, maybe three games. It's like this type of turnaround was impossible. And look at how small their scoreboard is. So Colorado will probably be getting some type of major renovation. By the way, the other weird thing, Colorado played at 10 a.m. So it was like the sun hadn't even risen yet. It was creating a shadow over the field. You know how you're used to seeing shadows when games are like in the afternoon and it's becoming night? Well, they had a shadow because the sun hadn't risen yet. That's how ridiculous the whole big noon thing is. But it does make for like a unique thing. You just never see games on at 10 a.m. Uh, but Colorado, it was super impressive beating, you know, Nebraska. And you may say Nebraska's terrible. Yeah, but Nebraska normally always plays teams close. They almost beat Minnesota, although Minnesota's not very good either. But either way, we're going to do a deep dive. We did have the huge game Texas at Alabama. Alabama ends up losing. Let's take a look. Let's see. Can Alabama rebound from this loss? They crush Middle Tennessee. They lose to Texas. They've got South Florida in a de facto neutral site game. That game is on the road technically, but it's at Raymond James Stadium. Should be a very easy win. I do expect them to stick with Jalen Milrow, but I don't have a great read on the situation. You know, judging Jalen Milrow, his week two game against Texas, there's some good, there's some bad. He's a young quarterback. I was a little bit disappointed. I thought he would have been able to really use his weight and his, you know, sturdiness to run over some players. Seems like he kind of shied away from contact. He does have a really strong arm. He made a really nice deep pass. I'm more concerned, and this is going to be Alabama's fatal flaw in my opinion. They still do not have that elite receiver. So they've got a really talented, deep, you know, defense with a lot of depth. Uh, facing Quinn Ewers, this is Ewers' big year. He's a junior. He has the experience. Now it's tough. Uh, but in general, that loss to Texas, it went back and forth there late in the third, early in the fourth. You thought maybe Alabama... This might be the time where they take control of the game, and it just didn't happen. Give Texas credit, but both of Jalen Milrow's interceptions, really bad. Both times, he simply did not see the defender, and now Bama's got to get back on track. They're going to beat South Florida, you would think. I do think the way the schedule sets up, I don't know, man. Back-to-back -back at Mississippi State at Texas A&M, you would think the way Alabama's playing right now, they would go 1-1 one and one in that stretch. You would think that. I think they beat Ole Miss because I don't think Ole Miss is very good. And plus, they've got them at home. But two straight road games, Will Rogers, veteran quarterback, Mississippi State slings the ball all over the place. A&M, even though they lost you know, to Miami, they're a very talented team. Going to Kyle Field, you know... They're facing Alabama. It's going to be a raucous environment. That's going to be a tough game. Arkansas at home. You know, Arkansas is no pushover. I was a little bit disappointed how Arkansas played against Ken State. They only won 28-6. to They were like 37-point favorites. You've got Tennessee at home. That game is going to be very interesting because Tennessee might be starting their true freshman QB at that point. 
We don't really know what to make of Tennessee. They had a very bad performance against an FCS team, but it's not like that game's going to be a gimme at least you wouldn't think, and then LSU, I mean, this is a very tough schedule because you've got those, both of those two-game stretches at Mississippi State, at a and and then verse Tennessee, and then verse LSU. So the idea that they're going to go 4-0 and over you know both of those two-game stretches seems very unlikely. It just seems unlikely. And then, you know, can they beat LSU at home? Absolutely. I did not buy LSU at the beginning of the season. I had Alabama winning that game versus LSU, and I still think they can win it because of their talent, uh, but it is going to be tough. At Kentucky, you would figure should be a win, but, you know, Kentucky's kind of an interesting team. They always have big crowds when they face, you know, good teams, so we'll see. Chattanooga's a freebie, and then they're on the road at Auburn. Auburn, you know, they did beat... Uh, California 14 to 10. They're trying to turn their program around end of the season. Maybe depending on what happens with Alabama, they could be susceptible to a loss because it is a rivalry game. But I would say Alabama, you know, you don't want to overreact to this and we understand the talent that they have. It it seems extremely unlikely that Alabama is going to be able to go undefeated the rest of the regular season, which is probably what it would take. There are people that do say, oh, Alabama can lose to a Tennessee, and and if they win all their other games, including the SEC championship, they're in as a two-loss team. And technically, you could make that argument because their non-conference loss is so strong, you know, losing to Texas. Texas might, they they might win all their games. I don't think they will. I think Texas will at least lose one time. Uh, But either way, a loss to Texas, people always make the joke it's a quality loss, whatever, but no, it is a quality loss, honestly, especially if Alabama, like imagine they barely lose to Tennessee, win every other game, win the SEC championship against Georgia. You could make an argument that a two-loss Bama should be in, but I I just don't think it's going to happen because Bama just, they don't have an elite receiver, like an ultra elite receiver, and it is a problem for them. Uh, But that's the first team I wanted to look at. Uh, The second team, it's going to be Wisconsin. So I'm sure a lot of Wisconsin fans very pissed off. They lose both the home and home games with Washington State. They went 0-2 against Washington State in that series, and they were 17-point home favorites last year against Washington State. They lose. They were 7-point road favorites this week, And they lose to Washington State again. And Washington State dealing with the whole, you know, Pac-12 issue. They're probably going to have to drop down to a group of five status. This is a bad loss. But I would caution Wisconsin fans. I would say take a deep breath. You're still 0-0 in the Big Ten, right? You're still in a very easy division in the Big Ten West. Calm down. This is a new team with a lot of transfers. Trust Luke Fickle. You've got Georgia Southern, you've got a Friday game at Purdue, you've got Rutgers at home, you've got Iowa at home, Illinois is really bad this year, Ohio State at home is going to be your Super Bowl, at Indiana is a relatively easy game, you get Northwestern a free win, Nebraska is going to be an easy game, at Minnesota, so these are very winnable games, I would calm down, it's a very bad loss, but this is a situation, this day and age, with the transfer portal, You're going to have these teams really struggle early on in terms of their cohesion. And I think that's one of the big problems that Wisconsin had week two on the road against a veteran quarterback and a veteran team. It's a bad loss. Don't get me wrong. You're seven point favorites. You would love to win that game. But the way their schedule sets up, you're still zero and zero in the Big Ten. The goal is to still make the Big Ten championship and it's right in front of you. And I think they're going to get really revved up for that. That's going to be a 7.30 game on NBC versus Ohio State. That is the ultimate prize for them. But they need to make sure they win that game on the road at Purdue. Purdue's a sneaky team. A lot of people wrote off Purdue because they lost to Fresno State week one. They come back and I said they would win outright as three-point underdogs at Virginia Tech. They deal with the adversity of the weather delay and they win the game easily. And by the way, I mean, the amount of weather delays that we had yesterday, it was absolutely crazy. And then taking a look at Colorado, guys, Colorado's schedule, I don't want to say 9-3 and yet, but it it is impressively easy, uh, especially for a tough Pac-12 when you look at it. At Colorado State, that's their one, I would say, easy non-conference game. That's a home game at 10 o'clock. And then this is where it gets tough for Colorado. 
at Oregon. They're going to be big underdogs in that one versus USC. Now, you would love to somehow split those games. I don't think it's going to happen, but you would love to do it. At Arizona State, very winnable. Probably are going to be favorites going into that game against a true freshman QB versus Stanford. Very easy win. So those are at least three wins. Colorado State's a win. That gets you to three wins. You beat Arizona State. You beat Stanford. That's five wins. At UCLA's probably... It's going to be a toss-up, I would say, depending on what happens. Oregon State at home is a great matchup. Versus Arizona is going to be another win. And then at Washington State's winnable at Utah, another game that's winnable, but it's going to be tough. But you're talking about Colorado right now. Seems like 7-5, and 8-4 and four is very realistic, depending on if they're able to snipe an upset win against an Oregon or a USC. But even if you just want to play it safe and say, they beat Colorado State, they beat Arizona State, they beat Stanford, they beat Arizona, and then they win against you know a Washington State team. That's already seven wins right there. And then they've got a few toss-ups like a home game versus Oregon State, a game at Utah. It is going to be very important for Colorado. They have no depth. So they got a bunch of transfer kids, but they still do not have that depth because it's a team that was built in one offseason. So when you're dealing with that, you've got the Travis Hunters, you've got the Sanders, you know, Dion's kid, Dylan Edwards. But if they deal with injuries, it is going to be a big problem when it comes to their potential outlook mid-season, depending. Because right now they are healthy, but we will have to see what happens uh, with them. And then another team I wanted to outline, Oregon State. There's a lot of hype going on about them with DJ Uilungile. You can see they've started off 2-0. and They destroyed UC Davis. The context with that UC Davis win, you might look at it and be like, oh, it's FCS. It's not that impressive. They were only 24-point favorites. UC Davis apparently is a really good FCS team. But look at this schedule. San Diego State at home. That seems like an automatic win. The way San Diego State started off the season, they have not been good. That's 3-0. and at Washington State, that's very winnable. You get Utah at home, a Utah team who's probably going to be starting a rusty cam rising, and they really don't have a lot of skill position talent, losing Dalton Concaid. They lost Clark Phillips, the cornerback, to the draft. At California, very winnable game, although Cal has been a little bit better this year. You get UCLA at home, another very winnable game. At Arizona, another game that's very winnable. At Colorado is winnable versus Stanford's almost a free win. You're looking and you're thinking this Oregon State team could do something really special this year unless maybe they blow it and they lose to a Washington State on the road or whatever. But like I'm seeing this team, could they be 7-0, 8-0, 9-0? You have Washington at home towards the end of the season and then the really tough game, the Friday, Black Friday game at Oregon. I don't know, man. I'm, I'm, I'm telling people right now with Oregon State, this could be a storyline where they end up by week eight or nine when we get the first college football playoff rankings. They could be inside the top eight, like legitimately when you look at their schedule. Uh, but there is that. And then you do have the story. So I'm going to be very sensitive with this story, but I am going to analyze it from a college football perspective. Mel Tucker likely coached his last game at Michigan State. So... Uh, it's this story is very complicated. I, I'm not going to talk about the allegations or allegations or anything like that. But when you look at this from a Michigan State perspective, you get out of this contract without having firing him with claws, without having to pay the buyout. Oh my goodness, this is setting up for Michigan State. You know, Mel Tucker. You can say what you want. They gave him a very ill-advised contract after one good year, and it was like a ten-year deal. And are they going to be able to get out of this contract? Again, I'm not going to talk about the issue here, but just from a college football perspective, my, like, it's like, wow. It's almost like a get out of jail free card, but um, we'll have to see what happens with that Mel Tucker situation because there's allegations. There's a lot of people saying different things, but that could be a crazy spot for Michigan State where it's like a reprieve almost from a horrible contract without having to pay a buyout because Michigan State, they have money, they've got boosters, but do they have the money to, like, like this is almost like a Jimbo Fisher type contract where we keep talking about Jimbo Fisher having the crazy buyout. Texas A&M's got more money than Michigan State, especially when it comes to their boosters with all the oil money in the state of Texas. 
and, and they might not even want to pay the Jimbo buyout. So this is a crazy developing situation. We'll have to see what happens when it comes to it. But guys, that is going to do it for this video. Make sure you're following me on X. Link to that's always in the description.